Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. It's my first participation in, in a conference on, on modified Pisoni dynamics. Uh, I learned a lot about it already, whatever, more than 40, 15 years ago. Time flies in that respect. Um, and I was a bit curious to know how things are developing. And it's, uh, I come from a different field. Uh, I, I worked originally in string theory, did like whole physics, and I'm mostly interested in how to uh, combine gravity with quantum mechanics. And what I'm going to tell you today are about developments that, that people are thinking about, how to indeed derive gravity and, and even well, properties of space-time from a quantum perspective. It's a different field uh, of theoretical physicists, and uh, so well, we have to communicate here about a common interest, because I think that the, and, and that's I'm one of the few thinking about it, that this development about how to describe emergent gravity eventually will connect to the questions about how to think about gravity also at cosmological scales, and there we can make contact with these observations and, and the, the regularities that are found in, in uh, electric dynamics. Actually, when I wrote a paper in 2010 on the ideas of entropic gravity, I got a lot of response from many people among them were also emailed by Bob Sanders and uh, Motti Milgram, and I first didn't notice it. I mean, there were too many things being sent to me at that moment, but later, actually about two months later, I, I already had heard about this idea, or actually this observation, that in galactic dynamics there is some universal acceleration scale. And at that time, I was thinking about questions related to that, and I thought somehow uh, got intrigued by this. So I wrote them an email back here. I found it this morning still. First of all, I, I apologize for the late reply because it was like two months afterwards. Um, I've been thinking about the consequence of entropic explanation of gravity and inertia, especially in cosmology. I heard some years ago about months, but I must admit I never went into the details. I thought of it as just a phenomenological model without much theoretical justification. After a comment by a colleague who works in cosmology, I looked at your review on months and became quite intrigued by the general philosophy, especially the cosmological connection is fascinating. There was actually a question in that email about time scales, because I had some ideas about deriving gravity from an entropic argument where the temperature plays a role. And they pointed out to me that the time scale associated with the temperature and the time scale like for um, a planetary motion, they are is a different one. Anyway, I addressed this in the, in the email. I'm not going to show you that, but I want to show the end of it. Finally, it would be wonderful if the mom phenomenology and these theoretical ideas, the ones I was working on, can be merged into one, but I'm not sure that this is really involved changing the leader order equations. So I would rather have the fluctuations or thermal or quantum may eventually build up to something that has the same effect. In any case, I find it exciting that there are these puzzles out there, like rotation versus <coughs> and the pioneer normally was uh, mentioned often, that made other theoretical estimations than the ones currently believed by most physicists. This is still what I, I think. Um, I still think that, that modified <coughs> equations generally, I mean, why would you modify Newton's law? Einstein did not modify Newton's law, he, he followed a new theory. And that's also how I think about the next theory in, in uh, beyond Einstein. You're not going to write down another action that looks like Einstein's where you add some other things. Einstein's theory is a totally new theory with the new concepts, new ideas about space and time and gravity all together. And the geometry aspects went much further than, than Newton. If he would have wanted <coughs> want to explain Mercury's very little shift, he could have added a term to Newton's force, uh, and then he would have probably explained it. But that's not what his explanation is about. The same, I believe, is true in explaining these phenomena, is that we don't should not just think about Einstein's theory and try to modify it. We have to understand it and come up with a totally new underlying description of what gravity is and what space-time are in a language which is not the same as in which we wrote down Einstein's equations. So this is, I think, what is happening. And 
Curiously enough, I have to admit that when I learned that Jacob Beckenstein was involved in working on these modified Newtonian dynamics equations, I got a little surprised because the most of the relativists that I know, I mean, Bob was already uh, emphasizing Beckenstein is a relativist, and they really stick to general relativity. They find it very hard to modify or even change the concept that Einstein uh, introduced. But I also have to say that the two things that Beckenstein worked on, namely black holes and all the fundamental properties about entropy and so on, somehow in my reading of his work was disconnected from the work he did on, on modified controlling dynamics, at least as far as I can see. I'm going to interrupt the presentation a little bit because I want to show you a little um, contribution I wrote in the memorial of Jacob Beckenstein, where I did make the connection between his work of entropy and gravity and galactic dynamics. So we'll be talking about this more in the, in the presentation further. Anyway, there's uh, the famous beckenstein hawking formula. There's also the temperature that plays a role, which uh, famously contains an acceleration scale. This way it was written down by Unru. And then Beckenstein actually had an argument of why this entropy was there, which made use of kind of relations between the force and well, the changes in entropy. It's kind of that kind of relation that I also used in, in deriving these entropic gravity equations. <coughs> and one of the key equations is, in, is the equation five, where you indeed say that if you have a force which has work to do, that there's an associated change in temperature, or for in entropy. And then if the temperature is connected to the acceleration, somehow you get an answer for what the amount of entropy might be. <coughs> Namely, if you then estimate how much entropy is in a, a box, say, of size r with given mass m, you get another equation that Beckenstein derived, which is known as the Beckenstein bound, or the Beckenstein entropy, which has nothing to do with Newton's concept of gravity, but it was derived by thinking about the gravitational equations. Now what I will outline in this talk is actually the second part which I will get to, namely when we apply the same ideas, and, and this is as far as I know was not pointed out by, by Beckenstein, to cosmology where we think about the cosmological horizon and the cosmological temperature. I do think that, that well this I think was mentioned in the, in the email, uh, that the relationship with, with the Unru temperature in, in, in uh, the sitter space was kind of suspected, but I don't think there was a, an explanation of why this same scale would enter into the acceleration scale. The way I view this had to do indeed with um, similar ideas of Beckenstein again. I actually made a comparison between certain uh, estimates of entropy namely Beckenstein's entropy, and an amount of entropy that I will associate to dark energy. Anyway, this is what I wrote down in this review, and I think indeed it's kind of surprising and also quite a, a nice fact that all these ideas of Beckenstein somehow come together in maybe connecting uh, these holographic and quantum ideas to uh, cosmology. So let me go back to the <coughs> slides. So after having giving you this part, I'm going to go a little quicker, this is where I repeat those uh, entropy formulas and the famous Unru formula for the temperature in terms of the acceleration. But what's really uh, the key of thinking about emergent gravity is the fact that the equations of general relativity near black holes <laughs> take the form precisely of thermodynamic equations. So we know in thermodynamics there's a first law, which is the change in entropy of energy is proportional to the change in, in entropy. And we know how to derive that from a microscopic description in terms of, well, if it's a gas, we take the molecules and so on. But this equation applies very generally. And so on the left hand side I have an equation that's derived from gravity, from Einstein's equations. It's namely the change in the mass is proportional to the change in the area. Now, if we get the area interpretation in terms of entropy, and there's also sort of a temperature associated to that, then suddenly you start wondering whether you can derive these same equations in the same way that we derive also the thermodynamic equation. 
The only thing is that we shouldn't be talking about molecules. We have to talk about what are the microscopic constituents of space and time itself. We almost started treating space and time in the same way as we started thinking about uh, well, materials that have a temperature and an entropy, but so we now associate that temperature and an entropy to, to the, the space-time itself. So this idea uh, also led to what's now called the holographic principle, and this is what many people in the last 30, dec 30 years have been studying. I mean, it started with Beckenstein and that Hoft, Soskind, and Nalasena in particular have emphasized this idea that when you describe what's going on inside a certain part of space and time, you can do this by adding, well, bits or, or describing in terms of things that live on the boundary. And it's been very precisely realized in a space time that's not like ours, which is called anti consider space, which is the famous uh, ADS ADSCT correspondence. In these um, theories, we know that gravity indeed is not fundamental but can be derived from the microscopics. And you may wonder what is then the microscopic role of uh, molecules and so on. What is these bits that sort of are written on, on the horizon? Turns out this has to do with quantum entanglement. And this is the recent development of the last 10, 15 years where many people in the world, and not just me, are indeed deriving this new theory of emergent gravity. This is a, a poster, I think it's from the, the World Science Festival in, in New York, uh, where, where Brian Green talks with Lenny Suskind and Mark von Ramson, who was one of the, the first ones to point first ones to point out that indeed there's a connection between space, time, and quantum entanglement. Well, if you read what here it is written down, it actually makes clear that there is a new language appearing where we start to think about the microscopic of space time in terms of quantum threads sort of connecting uh, well different parts of, of the space. These are some other popular articles that are about this and, and it's kind of a new language which I'm not going to try and explain in this talk. I'm just telling you that I'm not the only one thinking about emerging gravity but my point of view is that when this theory has been developed we have a new theory that may explain things in, in particular in cosmology that uh, will lead then to the deviations of Einstein's theory and, and um, Newtonian dynamics, but not by postulating, well, some modified law, but by really understanding the microscopics and where, where it comes from. So space-time, not, not just gravity, but also space-time has to be emergent. They come together. And it seems to say, and this is, I think, agreed upon by many people in my field, and by many I really mean more people than in this room. I think about a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand people are almost already working in this field. We start to interpret space-time as a geometric representation of what is happening in the microscopic description in terms of entanglement. This formula, the area over 4G, actually measures the amount of entanglement between two parts of space-time when we separate it by a horizon. And then you can write down laws of thermodynamics, it's actually called the laws of entanglement of well, entropy. There's some first law that plays a role, but then when you write it out, exactly corresponds to well, the gravitational equations. There's one assumption that goes in, and then you have to identify this entanglement with the area. So there's some way that the geometry has been put in by identifying entanglement with area. I'm not going to explain what's on this slide, I'm just showing you this because this is, I think, probably the, the most precise way that people have been making those connections. They're basically saying there is a, a region of space that I can think about as being inside what's called a causal diamond. We just take some part of space inside a certain volume R. Uh, there's a mass inside and you ask what's the modification of gravity due to this additional <coughs> mass, and I think it's a change in the area because of the change in the entropy. And this is indeed the first law that I wrote down here. And it turns out that this change in entropy, of, of, yeah, the change in entropy can be written down also in terms of the integral of the stress energy tensor. And then if you work out these equations, they actually can be shown to be equivalent to the Einstein's equation. 
this goes indeed back to von Ramsdorff, in particular Jacobson, who was the first actually to think about Einstein's equations as sort of uh, derived from, uh, from uh, thermodynamics or, or with the connection also to quantum entanglement, which already goes back well, to 96 or something like that. There's one part actually that people don't talk about a lot. Uh, people talk mostly about deriving Einstein's equations. We know that in modified uh, Newtonian dynamics, you also have to worry about, well, there's the other side of the equation, which is the inertial force, which might also be uh, relevant. And this is a part that I actually emphasize mostly in my work. Uh, namely, I said that if you want to derive gravity, that's not sufficient. You first have to tell, well, say, what is inertia. I mean, there's some way that mass has to be defined, or even what is inertial motion. And so here I sort of explain that, that we have questions about it. What causes this? What is, why is it also sometimes thought about as a force? Because in Einstein's theory, in a certain way, gravity is no longer a force. You should basically identify it with inertia. So it is the, the inertia aspect that gives us the impression that there is a force acting. And I also relate this to what I call the Machian question, because there's some way that you may also wonder how is the inertial frame determined in a certain area of space and time. And this, when you start rederiving Einstein's equation, is also a question that you have to start addressing. And this is where I need make use of ideas of Jacob Beckenstein. I mean, this is what, what kind of a way of deriving the inertial force by using the same kind of idea that the change in, uh, in energy is related to the change of well, the work that you do, and then if you postulate it, this is actually, a, you could almost say the definition of the mass, then, then you actually recover when you put in the, the right temperature that the force is exactly the inertial force. This, by the way, indeed is a version of Beckenstein's argument by which he derived the Beckenstein argument. Um, he indeed assumed uh, that you can lower a box to a horizon, and he asked the question, by how much does the entropy change when I put the box inside the black hole? That puts a bound on how much entropy I can put in the box, but the total entropy namely has to increase. And that means that the entropy in the box cannot be higher than a certain number. And that certain number is exactly this thing I showed you before, the mass times the radius in, in natural units. This formula uh, was criticized a lot, actually, when it was first proposed, because it seemed to indicate that somehow you can never increase entropy by adding, for instance, more species inside a box and so on. And nowadays, we, we know this formula as sort of a very precise version of it, which is exactly what I showed you before. This first law of entanglement entropy is now accepted as a preciser way of formulating uh, Beckenstein's uh, found. So let me now go to connect to, to the cosmological uh, side. For that I need one more equation that I will write down, uh, which is kind of a uh, curious observation, namely if I calculate in gravity, just normal Newtonian gravity, the amount of gravitational energy that you have, you do sort of the analog of what you do for electromagnetism, you write E squared divided A by G, <coughs> well, in, in electromagnetism, 4 pi f to 0 or something like that. But this is an energy that's contained in the gravitational field. Now, if you put in just Newton's law, there's some curious way of writing it where you connect it to the entropy that Bekenstein derives and the temperature that Umbu derives. If you multiply the two, you get this quantity. One immediate observation that I think everyone here will uh, understand is that if I replace this g by the cosmological acceleration, I would have a way of formulating mod. Because I basically take the square root out of the equation. And actually, this is indeed a way I thought the connection with fluctuations might appear. Because if you have a system in a thermal situation, and you ask about what is the size of typical fluctuations of, say, the electric, uh, the energy in, in the system, it's the number of degrees of freedom that you can associate with the system times the temperature. You can think about it sort of as n times t. So if you take Beckenstein's entropy as sort of the number of degrees of freedom associated with this quantity, 
then if you put the cosmological temperature here, there, you would derive an effect that would look like one. And that's kind of the uh, interpretation I gave of it. Um, so I'm going to go now to cosmology and he asks the question, what is the entropy content of our universe? Normally, we associate entropy to things we see, like photons and, and maybe matter that's there. But empty space, usually we don't associate an entropy to. However, uh, I, I think there must be a reason, well, there must be actually entropy in here, because if you see the energy content, I really think it's a very important fact that we call it dark energy and not just a cosmological constant. Because I think that energy represents something that can be transferred from one form of energy into another thing. That's why we think about energy as sort of a currency that we can exchange between one and the other things. And so this dark energy is more than, well, 70% of that order. And then the um, entropy is usually assigned to only this little bit if you only can't count entropy, it's the CMP. But if you add black holes, you get a lot more, but you would get a lot more even if you would think about the cosmological situation when we add horizon as well. Since dark energy is most of what we have in our universe, let me, as an approximation, first consider the universe with only dark energy. In that case, we live in the Sitter space, which is a static space, it expands, you might say, exponentially, but that's only when you write down certain coordinates. But if you have only dark energy, it's a static space where you can put an observer in the center of a region of space that has a horizon. And this is kind of where I think our view of how the universe should look like should be looked at. So I would think about our universe as sort of when we are in the middle of it as being contained in, in one bubble horizon and if indeed the universe would only have dark energy in it, that horizon would be the farthest we can see. There will never be uh, communication with things outside. And there's also an entropy associated to it, which is much larger than any other entropy in, in, in the universe. It's even higher than this number. I think it's 10 to the 20, 124 or something like that. So what is this entropy? It's associated, as I said, with the horizon. So I'm going to introduce, well, there are many scales you can introduce. You can either call it the Hubble expansion. You can also call, call it the length scale, which is the Hubble length. Of course, this is also then dimensional, at least in order of magnitude, related to the accelerator scale that we see in, in, in galaxies. But let me write it in this form, because I want to make uh, an argument why this scale also shows up in the galaxy rotation. So I want to make the connection between the two. So this entropy that I talked about is an entropy that I can now associate to the cosmological horizon. And it's given by the same formula of Bekenstein and Hawking. But now the, the size of the horizon is the, the, the Hubble scale. There's also temperature, which is also set by the Hubble scale uh, with this relation. And now, why does this entropy come from? Well, it comes due to the expansion of the universe, which is due to the dark energy. And the dark energy is filling the entire universe. So I associate this entropy, and even the temperature, to the dark energy. The idea that the Sitter space has this very large entropy is now actually uh, coming back also in, in more recent work. One of the things that happened in my field, which is kind of new developments that are going on in emergent gravity, is that people are moving away from this ADS space, and people indeed are realizing that we don't live in anti Jupiter space, that we live in a, in a cosmological universe with a positive dark energy. So people are trying to implement these ideas about holography and so on in, in, in a Jupiter space. This is a recent paper by Ed Witten and collaborators, and I'm just putting here some part of their abstract. They consider indeed what's called the static patch of the Sitter space. So this would be indeed the patch that an observer would see right in the middle of this sort of inside his horizon. And then they argue that actually anti the Sitter space is a maximum entropy state. Indeed, if you add things to the Sitter space, the entropy goes down. 
and the amount of entropy is given by, well, it's called the generalized entropy, namely the sum of the area term plus whatever entropy is there as well. And so indeed they identify the entropy of the, we call the ground state of the sitter space with this number. And I think that is an even important, well, development because more people are now taking this entropy also seriously. And I think that when we start deriving again these laws of gravity using this uh, input, deviations may, may occur. So what I will do now is give you some, well, first of all, a theoretical fact and then an observation of that. The theoretical fact is that, as I said, the entropy in the sitter space is maximum. If I add some matter to it, it actually goes down. You can calculate by how much it goes down. You basically look at me at the size of the horizon. Well, the size of the horizon is determined by, well, the form of the metric. Uh, well, the, the, this part was already in the sitter metric. This is the term that you add when you add matter. And then you have a new equation that has a new solution, which is smaller than the old one. The old horizon was at distance L. This is smaller, and actually there's a change in entropy, therefore, which is negative, which actually obeys the first law, but with some funny minus sign. It's namely the energy that you added divided by the temperature. So it's again the same law that we saw before, and actually not surprised because I derived this by using Einstein equations. But now I interpret this as a, a, a microscopic equation, and it tells me something about the amount of entropy I should associate to any matter that's being added. And that matter may be a galaxy somewhere sitting in, in the center, and indeed it would sort of reduce the size of the horizon, and actually there's a certain reduction of entropy associated with that. Now this number also shows up in the observations. So, so it's not like the negative capacity of a central So you get what? Negative capacity of uh, self-gravitational. No, it's more subtle than that because for black holes it would be a positive number, but you might actually say whether I'm adding the matter or I'm sort of removing it from the system. There's a little bit of a subtle minus sign. But there, there are analogies with that, but anyway, we can discuss this, this later. But the minus sign to me says indeed that, that in adding matter, the matter actually comes from using the energy that's there, maybe the dark energy, and putting it in another form. And that way I have reduced the number of possibilities. The entropy was actually maximum when all the energy was in the form of dark energy. So it's this reduction kind of that is essential in my argument. And the observation fact that I want to point out, and here I use, of course, what Milgram found, namely the fact that there's this acceleration scale. I know there should be maybe a factor of three different here, but I uh, wrote it down in this form that at least uh, this starts happening after a certain, uh, would go smaller than a certain uh, acceleration scale, that if you rewrite this equation, you can actually write it in this form, where this is exactly the same ratio I had on the previous slide, namely the mass, the energy divided by the temperature, and this is the area of 4G, which is kind of the change in the area that we also had on the horizon. So it's this equation somehow also seems to show up in, in these, these data. Now, the intuition I was having at the time, before I even learned about Mont, was already that uh, if you want to derive gravity from some change in entropy or information, that the, the universe somehow must be thought about as being filled with information, kind of like that this indeed this dark energy is a sea of information and that, that these galaxies are simply floating in that sea. What is the galaxy? <laughs> it's, it's this one of course, but they, these are other phenomena that have <laughs> quite, quite a different kind of interpretation. But for me, I have this picture in my head already as somehow that I should think about this in a very similar way as a think about this as sort of being embedded in, in a sea of stuff that normally you don't see, but it's there. Of course, other people might say it's the halo, but I think there's something else there. And it's kind of the dark energy and the dark matter, to me, are two phenomena related to stuff that we have not access to. These are the things that are emergent, but somehow we have to add the dark energy to it, and then the dark matter will then be kind of a, a consequence uh, of it. So what I assume now is that this entropy that I associate to the horizon 
of uh, the sitter space is actually distributed over the entire volume. Now, if I take a galaxy and I look at a small radius, some sphere inside of it, of radius r, you might ask how much entropy is associated with that region. Well, what I've done here is simply taken this entropy and evenly distributed it over this volume, and then just take the fraction that's inside of here. Because this is an object that grows like the volume, and so when I put capital R equal to capital L, it becomes this number. So I've done nothing else. So this is the amount of entropy that dark energy would have had when the matter would be there. It would not have been there. Actually, it would have been inside this volume. This dark energy would carry that amount of entropy. Now, you can ask, well, how much entropy does matter take away inside this radius r? I already gave you an answer. Actually, back inside it. It's namely this number. That's Bekenstein's entropy. This was the amount of entropy I said was there in the dark energy. And when this number is smaller than that number, then this dark number. So that's my reasoning, which I also put down in, in the, in the Bekenstein review. And for me, this is an argument why things are happening, because there's a connection between the amount of entropy that I associate with dark energy and the phenomena that we observe when we also associate the entropy to the matter that we see. And then you see the scale kind of appearing, basically because of the entropic scale that we have, and it's actually the entropy density, you might say, that's associated with the dark energy. How am I doing with time? 13 minutes. 13 minutes. So I'm going to now uh, go to a little more of a logical uh, way of describing things. Uh, one thing that I noted, I already mentioned this uh, energy in the dark in, in gravity, that when you integrate this and you use the Mondrian relations, that actually you find that the answer is equal to Bekenstein's number times this number. So this was actually the equation. So what I, I wrote down here is the energy contained in a region inside a certain radius r, and that grows with r. A linear if the matter would be sort of simple. But if this mass, by the way, is distributed, this equation would do things in a quite a different way. Which, by the way, is the reason why I believe that this formula is not exactly the same as Mont. It becomes Mont when, when the mass is indeed central, because then you can differentiate both sides and you get an equation between d squared and m, which kind of is the, the usual uh, Mont type formula. The, um, thing that I well did here, namely, is sort of see if there's a reason why this quantity can be occurring, and it has to do what I said indeed with fluctuations that have to sort of be induced by this this temperature. By the way, this is what I did for me. He actually put in that, that that formula, and he showed me exactly this energy uh, in in the uh, stars and the gas, and he, he calculated this correlation, uh, so we actually just tested this form of the first test. Um, of course, it's just a rewriting. Actually, these are, of course, now much better tested. I mean, this is a, the, the, the relation that Stacy showed, the, the radial acceleration relation, and, and now it's a current uh, extension also with, with uh, the work of Marco Bauer and, and, and uh, that's it. He, here that uh, on, on this weak lensing data that sort of have expanded this to, to much larger region. So this relation at least is there. I have to admit, I don't think about it as a law. I don't think it's a law, it's a correlation. And there's some way in which we have to be, understand this correlation as a certain effect. And I think the effect is there, but it's not a, a new force law or a, a modification of Einstein's equations. It's really a new effect that can occur in systems that have a lot of entropy and where you have removed a certain amount of entropy because that was the way I argued that something should be happening. So I indeed started looking at phenomena that might occur in those systems. Picture is almost like this. So I removed this amount of entropy associated to the mass. Uh, this, this amount of entropy was there. So when this 
quality is larger than this, so I've actually removed all the entropy. So there's a certain part of the space where there's no entropy in the dark entity anymore. And this is where Newtonian dynamics and also GR works perfectly. It's only when this quantity becomes smaller that there's a certain amount of entropy left in the dark energy where a new additional force might sort of be uh, working that behaves like, like dark matter. Um, I also like to make a fair comparison to what I know as glassy dynamics because there are systems in, the, in, in nature where you don't know that there's entropy. Basically, if I take a crystal, it has a unique ground state. There's no entropy density, but the glass has a lot of entropy in it because it has all these different configurations. But yet, they behave very similarly. Any test I can do with short time scale dynamics, the two will do the same. It's the long time scale dynamics, which is very different. And that's kind of what glassy dynamics is about. So I feel that this correspondent, sorry, the, yeah, the, the idea that Entropy is responsible, and particularly an entropy with such a low temperature as the what is the cosmological scale, the dynamics should be very slow. It should not be something like a, a an effect that you can see sort of propagating with speed of light or, or anything like that. It's a slow dynamics that will sort of play a role. And I also think about it as a memory effect, and that means that uh, if you know where you have removed the entropy somehow the effects would occur there, but if there's some dynamics on top of that, it might become very complicated. And this is also why I think that the, the, the laws that for the relations that we're going to derive may not be holding in all situations. Anyway, the relation I found actually is something that's kind of striking, the similar relation that precisely the one that I wanted to derive, I mean, just like the energies contained in an elastic medium. There was indeed a correspondence with the amount of volume or entropy that was removed. And this was coming from papers where indeed a sort of glassy dynamics was described. And I believe this is indeed the correct interpretation. So I may actually uh, the relationship between these ideas about memory effects in kind of what are called polymer systems by thinking about the dark energy as a, a, a kind of elastic medium. This was the amount of entropy that I removed. I also can calculate the entropy density, and then I can calculate the amount of volume that, that I remove, because it's basically the amount of entropy divided by the entropy density. Now, if you have an amount of volume removed, you also know by how much the areas get displaced, then you get sort of the displacement, which is sort of what electric, elastic materials are about, namely this equation. And somehow, in elasticity, you can derive exactly these relations. And if you put in the right volume, you get a relationship of this sort with a quantity which is called the strain. It's kind of the derivative of this displacement field U. And then the nice thing, which I kind of find striking, is that all the elastic quantities that you have, and even the forces that you can derive from them, can be very naturally translated into what looks like gravitational forces by the introduction of one scale one dimension of full quality. Because we have a potential here, an acceleration, well, surface mass density, mass density, and, and the mass. In elasticity, we have a displacement, a strain tensor, a stress tensor, body forces, point forces. But all these qualities can be mapped into the other one by only one scale. If you put them in like this, you can map all these equations. And actually, the equation I just showed you becomes the, the relation I have in, in these calculations. So that was the, the kind of explanation. I, I don't claim this to be a full theory because it's an argument uh, that, that uses um, well connections that, that we have not fully understood yet. This is why I think developing the theory uh, in, in, uh, of emergent gravity in the civil space becomes a very important uh, problem for the future also. Um, what I have done in my work and actually quite soon after writing these equations, is also using these equations to make connections with observations. But then I may be trusting the equation more than I should, because there's a certain way that I make assumptions about sort of equilibrium and that things have not been sort of too dynamical. The other thing that I assumed indeed is that I can use this relation even when the matter 
uh, density is not sort of central, but that I, I can uh, spread it out. Then it turns out that this equation differs from the long relations. There are extra factors that come in. I'll show that just to finish. Namely, uh, if I assume indeed that the matter is distributed outside the radius r, so that when I differentiate this with respect to r, I also pick up a term differentiating this contribution. I put in now these relations. Um, actually, I get the different equations. Um, so here I just write down uh, a matter distribution where I assume there's some average density that is a function now of r, this is the definition of these quantities. Then if you differentiate with respect to r, this relation comes out. And I indeed use this, and, and there's actually a modification of, of what happens in, in, in Mont, because this is actually um, a quantity that if the matter would be concentrated in, in the center, this would actually fall off with minus 3. And so you would get a 1 here. But if the matter density for instance is constant, this would be 0. And then I get an additional factor of 4. Actually, this is an equation for an average effective dark matter density. So what I did now was just put plug in equations. And, and one of the things I checked was actually a paper by Bob Sanders for clusters. And I found that things work quite be much better. I did know that there was a factor of 4, which he kind of needed. And I got kind of a factor of 4 if I assume indeed that the difference between, say, a situation with a concentrated matter density or a spread out matter density is basically putting this to 3 or, or minus 3 or to um, 0 actually produces a factor of 4. I just tried to sort of mimic the, the plot he had there and I was kind of successful. This is another thing I did. I put in uh, indeed a constant density and then you can even compare to cosmological evolution, uh, well, cosmological number. And then it somehow magically also the same relation seems to sort of fit quite well with, with, uh, with the data that comes from the CEP. Anyway, I think I'm at the end of my talk, so I'll, I'll just put here a slide with uh, conclusions. Uh, I do think that gravity, I mean, this is sort of what, what many people now agree on, can be thought of as an emergent force, and that the key thing is there the entanglement entropy that's there in the vacuum. GR can be derived, but then you have to assume that the entanglement entropy always goes like the area. What I claim now is that the sphere space and when it has dark energy is different because there's also entropy in the volume, and then the laws or the, even the, the ways you have to derive the gravitational force need to be changed. Well, I sort of argue that this entropy leads to the glassy dynamics, and then you might actually see deviations happening. And I think this is kind of the picture that the normal laws of, of gravity kind of hold in a region where the dark energy is not that important, but it's when, when the entropy starts entering that we can normally associate to the, to the horizon, this is where the deviation starts. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. I think the idea is very attractive. That I'm, I'm not understanding uh, what do you mean by entanglement. Is it really the same definition that we have in uh, quantum physics when you have uh, two uh, wave uh, <laughs> form uh, entangled or not? Because it is so huge uh, distances that uh, certainly the entanglement will be zero after some time because there will be decoherence or something. Well, is it another definition of entanglement? So, as you know, uh, entanglement was introduced by Einstein. He talked about spooky action at a distance. So it can, I mean, he, you can have something being entangled with things very far away. What I'm entangling here is not the kind of small bits or, or spins of electrons and so on, which are the things that we control in our lab. If you ask about the vacuum state, even because of quantum field theory, the amount of entanglement in the vacuum is actually divergent. 
across all the, 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 the virtual particles. I said maybe I should have even go back, come back to Hawking's derivation of, of Hawking radiation. What Hawking showed is that the vacuum, even near the horizon, looks like a very entangled state because he had particles on the left and on the right, which are the vacuum particles. And if you count all that entanglement, it actually diverges in form of field theory. It goes like the area divided by some cutoff scale that if you would take to zero, it would diverge. And what we have learned is that gravity sort of regularizes this, sort of that the entropy becomes area divided by Newton's constant, sort of Planck scale. So, so some people say this is what gravity does in the UV. I would turn it around by saying because of this entanglement entropy being finite, we get gravity. And so this is the kind of the reasoning. And, and indeed, it's true that it's larger than any entanglement that, that humans can control. And so this is also why we, we are not aware of it. But this is one of the changes that is happening now in, in, in our field, is that people have moved away from thinking about quantum mechanics as being only applying to very small systems and so on. It's really applying to everything in the universe, and then the amount of entanglement can also be And what about the, the amplitude of this dark energy? It fits with the quantum mechanics, or it doesn't fit? What do you mean by the amplitude? Uh, well, uh, a lot of people have tried with the uh, uh, quantum energy to fit the dark energy. It was not orders of magnitude different. No, sorry, for me, I have to admit that, that in this whole problem, I, I'm not without a scale. I mean, I think there are two scales in the problem. One is the Planck scale, and then well, the other one is a cosmological scale. Or you might say there's a large number, which is this large entropy that's there. So if I put in that number, of course, I get the right amount of dark energy also with, with the properties. But you may be your questions about the other thing, that's something else. Or Thanks. Uh, this is Pong Fili from Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Germany. So I've heard your theory for many years, so I have a very basic question. So from your model, it says gravity emerges from entropy, which is a statistic concept. So how does your model, how or if does your model work for individual particles? Which, for which we do not have the statistical sense, or, you, or maybe you don't care about the gravity for individual, individual particles because they're too small to be measured? So I, I, as I already explained, the, the entropy that we normally think about, and even the entanglement we normally think about, is things in the lab, in terms of particles and so on. This is entropy that applies to the building blocks of space-time, which is not something that should be thought about in terms of particles. The amount of entanglement is A over 14. If you calculate that number, it's huge. It has nothing to do with, so if you ask what particle changes in that uh, amount of entropy, Beckenstein gave us the number. That number is also enormously much larger than anything that you normally associate to entanglement or even statistics. So it's not the statistics of individual particles that I'm talking about. It's not the entropy of a system in a box or something like that. It's, it's a much larger number, and I gave you the numbers. So if you want to know how much entropy I was talking about for particles, a certain amount of matter inside a certain region, calculate what Beckenstein's number is. It's the it's largest number of particles you have to microwave background, and that's your so I, I already gave you the numbers of what is the maximum entropy we normally associate to anything that, that we think of as matter in the universe. That amount of entropy is irrelevant in this whole thing. Thank you. Uh, I just had a, I mean, I'm Srikant, I'm from Observatory of Strasbourg. Uh, it's a it's a basic question. So, uh, when you talk of entropy and, and uh, there are some in some slide you said uh, when we add matter to the universe, entropy changes. So, I was wondering how is the change of entropy if you look at the point of uh, CMP and to the current universe? How does it change? Like, is is this question even making sense? But I want to know how it evolves. 
how entropy evolves. How entropy evolves, like most evolution is adiabatic. Entropy is conserved. No, like, like uh, you you said this of like you shouldn't think of it as a lab particle thing, right? So I'm a bit uh, I was wondering how it changes. What do you mean by so? If I have a universe that only consists of dark energy, okay. its energy is there, and somehow I think about our universe as not having been originated as whatever big things. Whatever. To me, it is an emergent body. So there's something there that is from the beginning there, and the matter that we now see is energy in a different form. Namely, it's not dark energy. So somehow that the energy that was the first there in the form of say dark energy has been transferred from one form to another form. This is what we do all the time with energy. So there's a way that, that, that the dark energy component has a memory of the fact that the energy was transferred from its dark energy form to what we now call particles. Thank you. So particles is only a very small bit on the, on the entire sea of, of information that's there. So most of the, what's happening in the universe, we have no idea of. Because it happens in a dark energy. Kind of work back down to the middle. Say here and then on me. Thank you very much. Um, well, definitely I'm not smart enough to understand everything here. <laughs> um, but of what I understand basically, and tell me if it's wrong, is that you expect also to get different boosts uh, of energy depending on the redshift, right? Just because you, you're going to get different states of transformations so and you to the glassy states. If you look galaxy at high redshift, we'll have a different behavior than galaxy at low redshift. This is, is about the, 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 the cosmological evolution you're asking. I had some slides at the end which I didn't get to, which is about that. I don't think that we understand the theory well enough to have full answers to those questions. But it's certainly an interesting fact. I mean, one of the questions that you raised about the, the redshift dependence of A0. I actually identified A0 with the Hubble expansion, but in a static universe, so the Hubble constant doesn't even evolve. So the question is, is whether it's related to the Hubble parameter or to the dark energy component, which might be something that gets this kept constant. And that, that is still open. I mean, that would be a lead principle to different type of evolutions. Uh, of I have, I have a question on nested systems. Um, in, in this morning session, we had a um, Q, uh, case showing that, um, that, that there's evidence for non Newtonian behavior in white binaries in the solar neighborhood. Now, uh, the solar neighborhood is, is not, a, in terms of going around the galaxy, is not in the deep bond regime. The accelerations uh, are somewhat higher than uh, overall uh, matter distribution and so on. Give you accelerations which are uh, about uh, two way zero or something like that. No? So, uh, however, the internal dynamics of, of, of a white binary at the solar neighborhood can be at an, at an internal acceleration much lower than this zero. So, what happens with nested systems here? Uh, if, if, if the galactic orbit is within the uh, uh, Newtonian region, let's say, can you have an internal orbit in that region that is non Newtonian? I, and my intuition is, and actually it's related sort of to this picture, is that, that I don't, uh, as soon as that you have a, a, a Newtonian UZ, you basically have to remove the effect. So I would have, my expectation is that I've not fully developed the theory to that point, is that any system that's inside another system, where suddenly the accelerations become smaller, will not have those effects. So I'm not actually predicting anything in the solar system. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. So, Hong Xing, and then we'll try to leave some time for uh, Thank you for that reminder. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. I'm very much into this uh, entropic-driven uh, gravity. And uh, I want to understand um, uh, uh, your, uh, your idea uh, of a glassy state for the for whatever is responsible for that entropy. Uh, at, uh, as a non-particle physicist, could you just help me to figure out 
what's the order of magnitude of entropy that is associated with all the black holes in the galaxy. We heard that is much more than all the baryons, the entropy provided by. Yeah, I, I had a number here somewhere, I think, we can discuss it the next week. That number keeps changing over time. Yeah, but is it, again, is, it a, so, is it the so square so root of your entropy or not? Is it of the order of the square root of your entropy? Or I haven't thought about this. It's interesting to talk about it. Okay, like, good. I made the interesting point. Anyway, right? I also want to know your opinion about black holes, whether that could sell things in, in the center of clusters and so on. But uh, that's, I think, for discussion uh, outside of this. Okay. One last question. Uh, uh, I, oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I understand that your theory is not fully developed yet. Uh, I just, uh, my impression was that uh, your theory does not satisfy the principle of universality. Of what? The, the universality of acceleration, the uh, weak equivalence principle. Uh, I, I mean, that's what people have been telling me. So, uh, I, and you have never mentioned the equivalence principles anywhere, any sort of equivalence principles. Would you comment on, I mean, uh, I, and also in, in general, uh, even if your theory is not fully developed and then you just uh, uh, set out basic uh, some framework, I mean, uh, could, you, I mean could you tell us whether your theory can be falsified at this point? Thank you much more so than any theory of quantum gravity normally has done. So what I hope will happen is that my colleagues who uh, are working on quantum gravity and so on eventually start realizing that the effects that we're describing there also may uh, include an IR scale that makes it much more directly observable. So I think that what I did is at least having observable consequences, which also makes it falsifiable. But I don't have a fully developed theory, which of course may sound like I don't have uh, told you yet what you have to falsify. But <laughs> I'm going to remain in that, that comfortable situation. 